and welcome to this webinar for Ready to Loop, where we are officially launching the new layer for value recovery companies. I am um, very much looking forward to sharing with you today the webinar. And just uh, uh, will inform you we're we're recording the the webinar today as well, so that you can uh, see it later on, and others can see it that can't join us today. So, by way of introduction, my name is Tim McAloon, and I'll be uh, running the webinar together with Daniela Pigoso, and then also with Nikki Bai and with uh, Jia Chin, who are both consultants on the project and uh, can help with accelerator projects. More about uh, Jars and Nikki's input a little bit later. Let's make a, a start. So we are basically, and I think that all of you in the webinar today are the converted, so we don't need to spend too much time preaching to the converted, but we basically have a number of challenges for sustainability that we're uh, addressing. And um, we have at least a climate challenge, a toxicity challenge, a resource challenge, and a biodiversity challenge, if not to say crisis. And with the Ready to Loop project, what we're trying to do is to directly um, address the challenge of the, uh, the resources as a means to um, addressing other um, uh, sustainability challenges as well. I can see there's a problem with my video, so just bear with me like a ghost. Uh, they're all interrelated. So the idea here is that um, by focusing on the resource challenge uh, through circularity and circular economy, then we should be able to make a number of other uh, changes here. We can also see that the way in which we are behaving on our planet today is uh, is not very uh, uh, well behaved. We are um, tripling, or we have tripled our amount of materials extraction since 1970. Uh, we are set to almost double the waste generation uh, between now and 2050, if we keep on the same trajectory. Um, and because of that, because of the waste uh, creation and also the resource extraction, we're creating enormous challenges in terms of biodiversity loss, water stress, and so forth. So, and the 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 other interconnected problem there is that we have an enormous dependency on uh, materials, but also on uh, a strategic dependency in different countries and different parts of the world. So, this is something that we would like to to decouple. Finally, we can see that the in terms of planetary compliance, there's a lot of talk about planetary boundaries at the moment and the uh, circularity gap report by Circular Economics, Economics is a very, very nice, uh, or not nice, but uh, actually um, uh, surprising and, and uh, daunting uh, figure that they, the, the world is, uh, we as a, a global population are just 7.2% circular at the moment. The bad news is that last year it was eight point something and the year before it was nine point something. So we're going in the wrong direction still. So these are the challenges that we're, we're facing and looking into. What we're looking at from a circular economy perspective is, and in the Ready to Loop project, is that we should look at um, the whole of the value chain and how circular are we as a, a global society from a value chain perspective. How do we actually make the, the change from a, a linear to a, a circular economy? How do we um, make the collaboration across the value chain, of course? And what are the potential benefits we can get there? And as a point of departure for the Ready to Do project, we've seen that the, the circular economy only can arise if we actually collaborate across the whole value chain. This particular webinar today is focusing on one phase, uh, one stage of the value chain, which is the value recovery stages. So we start at the top of the, uh, at one o'clock on the clock, if you could say, from materials providers. Then we go to component manufacturers, to product manufacturers, to logistics companies, to retailers, to maintenance and repair organizations, and then to what we're calling value recovery companies. And all of these different value chain partners are extremely important uh, for us to 
understand how to first assess how our circularity readiness and then after that to see how we can actually make the change to circularity in collaboration across the value chain at the end of the webinar we'll show you which of the other layers as we're calling them the other value chain layers that are available and we can talk about the the, the roadmap for how we're uh, planning to put the different layers and uh, to, to release the different layers as we go along but value recovery companies is um, a strange uh, um, size it is um, it can basically uh, comprises of four different types of stakeholder First of all, we uh, say that we're focusing on companies which are looking at mostly processing end of use products or end of use components. And of course, the absolute best would be to keep the products in their entire uh, intact state and see if we can get a, a recirculation at a product level. If that's not possible, we go to a recirculation at a component level. And there are a number of different strategies there that can help us, such as remanufacturing, refurbishment, repurposing. If that's not possible, then we need to look to the next best is to recover materials um, and re look at materials through end of life um, uh, products, through cascading, through recycling, or through energy recovery, which is the last option that we'd like to, to actually address. But these are the four main stakeholder types that we're actually encompassing when we're looking at value recovery companies and the platform that we've created here or the layer in the platform we've created here is addressing all four of these companies. I'm going to hand over to Daniela now to introduce us to the dimensions of this particular layer for value recovery companies and to introduce us to that and to the first uh, parts of the of, of the uh, the readiness assessment. Over to you Daniela. Thank you. And before we actually start having a look into the dimensions, it's really important to uh, talk a little bit more about how they were developed. We really have a really strong science-based approach within ready to loop which means that we look into hundreds of different academic literature to actually be able to understand what are the key areas that a company within the value recovery layer need to focus in order to make this transition to a circular economy. After the systematic review, we actually had a number of validation workshops, both internally, but also externally, involving companies that are within uh, this layer. And we are really proud to share with you today the final result of these months of work in coming up with uh, what is important to take into account in terms of becoming more ready to a circular economy for value recovery companies. And we basically found out seven different dimensions that are key. The first one uh, at the center deals with the organizational issues, understanding how to set up organizations that can help to recover value from product, products, components, and materials, but also how to run that in an efficient way. What are the different uh, business models or areas that we can look into? Uh, and what is the overall circular economy strategy that we have in there? Uh, the next animation. And then after that, we can also have a look into what is value recovery innovation, meaning what are different innovations that we can have within our company to enhance how much value we are managing to recover. Moving forward, we have the operations, understanding how to make our operations as efficient as possible so that we can actually recover more value. Looking into how can we actually take advantage of the biggest digitalization revolution we are, we are in just now in terms of technology and data. Looking to looping, how can we ensure that we are looping materials and processes and products in the most efficient way? And last but not least, looking to the external environment and how policy and market is actually influencing us. If you've been part of the preview launch webinars for the other layers, you might recognize some of the dimensions. And it's really key to see that actually for some of them, it doesn't really matter in which position of the value chain you are, they will also be. What we are going to do right now is to run dimension by dimension 
telling you a little bit more about what are the aspects inside each one of them and also giving you an inspirational example showing how companies are actually already uh, moving in the direction of circular economy as well. Let's start with the one at the center, the organization. Being ready for a circular economy in terms of organization means having the capabilities, the knowledge and the skills to make the implementation. It also means defining targets that are both ambitious and achievable at the same time. It also means understanding what are the procedures that you need to have in place inside the organization to ensure value recovery. It's also about understanding what's the environmental feasibility of different solutions. We know that circular economy is not necessarily more sustainable or more environmentally friendly. Therefore, it's always important to understand what's the environmental case for it. The same goes for the social feasibility of the given initiatives that we have and the economic feasibility, being sure we have a business case in place as well. And finally, uh, with any change uh, inside organizations and companies, there will be risks and investments that need to be made. And it's really important to understand how ready we are as a company to make that investment. And uh, the example that you have for you here today is the Danish return system. Um, and what's really interesting about them is that they were actually funded as a collaboration between beverage companies in Denmark that saw the need to take back their products at the end of life to ensure reuse or recycling. And they actually understood that this was outside of their boundaries as companies. Um, and they decided to join forces to create this new organization that is actually taking care of beverage systems. It is really effective because instead of having one specific take back system for each one of the different companies, they actually have a harmonized one, which ensures higher efficiency, but also higher effectiveness at the same time. And just to show how actually successful this system uh, became, in 2021, um, in Denmark, 93% uh, uh, of the sold disposable packaging were actually returned. And it's a very high rate, uh, which actually allows for a much more uh, strong value recovery of those different areas. Uh, with that, we go to the second dimension and I'll hand it over back to you, Tim. Thanks, Daniela. Yeah, so now the second dimension that we have on the readiness assessment for value recovery companies is strategy and business model innovation. And this is similar to the other layers we've released before, because of course, it's important to see what the strategic and business potential is for a company, for any company in the circular economy. That's why it's called circular economy. Uh, so uh, we try and keep, again, as many of the same aspects uh, for, for this uh, type of company as well. And here we're looking at uh, four main areas and the aspects here are uh, asking about the readiness of value recovery companies in terms of a long-term strategy. Now, the strange thing about this particular layer on the ready to loop platform is that companies may say, well, we are already recycling companies or we're already doing uh, some form of materials reprocessing or we're taking back products and so forth. Why, I mean, we're born uh, circular. Why should we uh, not have our strategy and business model in place? What we've seen from a number of studies is that you can get a lot of inspiration in, in being even more circular and getting more business out, uh, uh, almost regardless of, of where you are currently, whether you're a, a product, a component, a materials, uh, a recirculator, or whether you're incinerating. Of course, there's, there's, there's more opportunities the lower you go down in that hierarchy. So in this particular dimension, we're asking about what is the long-term strategy of the company? Is there a strategy to, to constantly raise the circularity activities and also therefore the business potential from the circularity activities? What are the revenue streams today, but what also are possible other revenue streams that 
the organization is looking into to see if we can make a uh, an improvement and a change there. What are the value propositions that we're offering? Are there different ways in which we can, can offer value than, for example, simply, or simply, uh, but uh, currently taking back products and, and grinding into materials and, and providing uh, material uh, granulates to a, to a manufacturing process, other, other value propositions we can do there. Can we make a promise of the material purity or can we make a promise of uh, delivering components instead of just materials and so forth? And then the, the fourth one is about external communication. How are we actually communicating this, not just through marketing, but actually communicating the way in which we are uh, running our, our circular uh, business activities. The example we've brought for you uh, here is uh, from a company called Ecris. And Ecris is located in uh, Jönköping in the southern part of uh, Sweden. And together with Volvo Cars, they've developed this, what they're describing as this ecosystem for remanufacturing of automotive components. And with that, of course, uh, the uh, the automotive aftermarket needs to be in place. So, uh, and that has been established for for some years. But uh, this uh, more, uh, you could say, constant and and cleaner uh, contribution to the automotive uh, aftermarket of uh, of components from used components from cars is actually bringing uh, a, a bigger business uh, for both vulnerable cars, but also also for for the Equus. And annually, more than 10,000 uh, parts are remanufactured uh, by this one company alone. And that fits very interestingly to uh, looking at on a European perspective. Um, by 2030, remanufacturing activities could, in principle, generate 90 billion euros of turnover for the European uh, uh, community countries uh, alone. So there's a, a, a sure business potential there. Over to you, Daniela, for the next dimension, which is value recovery innovation. You're muted, Daniela. Of course, I have to do it stage. at least once. Yes. Um, value recovery innovation. This is, of course, a key area to ensure that we are developing new technologies and new approaches to recover the maximum value possible of our products, components, materials. And here we have two main aspects that are really important to consider. The first one is the value recovery outputs. Actually, what we are getting when we are recovering different materials, are we going to the highest level possible of recovery? And if not, how can we actually innovate in order to be able to do that? And finally, how can we innovate from a technology and process? And the example that we have for you today is from a company called Enercam. What they are doing is uh, really interesting. They are taking non-recyclable and non-compostable municipal solid waste, and they are convert them into uh, chemicals, more specifically into methanol and ethanol that is renewable and can actually help to minimize the need for fossil fuels. It's the first company in the world to actually be able uh, to do it. And I would say that what's really interesting here is not only the technology and the process that they are using um, inside their organization, but actually the inputs they're having to their processes. Here we have no competition in terms of using uh, recyclable materials or using compostable materials that could reach a higher level um, of value at the end of life, but they're actually doing that with the waste that we don't really know what to do with at the end of life. And uh, just a fact uh, from Europe, in 2020, about 6% of all of the recovered waste was used for energy recovery. And uh, one might ask whether this is the right number um, or not. And this is, of course, has to do with what are the other value recovery possibilities for the different waste streams that we have uh, coming from Europe. Next, Shadini, next dimension, Tim. Next an area. The next dimension is about operations. And as mentioned before, these companies in the value recovery uh, layer of, of, uh, of the value chain are 
born circular in a lot of ways so we shouldn't actually ask them how they are doing in their 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 operations in too many details we just have two aspects here to focus on and one is about the recovery capacity and efficiency because just like a manufacturing company remanufacturing companies or collection companies can always increase and improve their capacity and their efficiency and it depends on a number of uh, strategic uh, activities uh, of investments of um, agreements with different value chain partners and so forth so we think this is an important one to to ask even the companies which are are, are born into this market of, of uh, recirculating products components and materials and then the second one is about production and quality control uh, we see re the, this uh, this value chain layer of this recirculation and value recovery companies as being actually a type of a production process, a reverse production process, of course. But um, we can apply the same types of um, of, of rules of thumb and, and of, of uh, precision to uh, remanufacturing and value recovery as we can do to manufacturing. So we have an aspect there which is prompting to say, how ready are we in terms of our production and quality control? And we can see that over time, quality control becomes more and more important um, to actually create a larger margin on the market for uh, recirculated materials, components, or even products. We're going around Scandinavia today in our webinar, so we're going to, to Norway now uh, for a, an example. And this is from uh, the company called Norsk Omburg. And Norsk Omburg, they extend the products uh, lifetime of household electrical goods. The way in which they do this is to uh, have a, a whole system, a reverse collection system in place, uh, but actually uh, a very, very effective logistics uh, setup. It has a very modern repair facility with skilled staff and established test and repair procedures, which gives them the possibility to uh, give a, a very reliable and competitive alternative to the informal waste collection sector, but also to the user, of course, uh, that can have a reconditioned uh, machine, washing machine, or what type of a white good they may care to, to, uh, to subscribe to. Here's a bit of good news. I think 39% uh, uh, is the recycling rate of EU electroelectronic waste in the EU. Um, you could ask yourself, this is figures from 2020, is 39% high enough? I think it's it's higher than some of the other figures we can see. And recycling here is not just about reuse and repair, uh, as we're seeing on the beautiful picture behind, but at least the recycling rate. There's a You can say there's a reverse system which is being more and more well-established to be able to take electronics back and to uh, electrical and electronic equipment back. But now we need to see how we can get the more value out of that as we can. So the next dimension over to you, Daniela, which is technology and data. Yeah, and there are two big revolutions happening in the world just now. One is circular economy, and the next one is digitalization. And when both of them come together, we actually uh, have a great potential to achieve an even higher circularity. And this is exactly what this dimension is about, trying to understand how ready companies are to use technology and data to enhance resource processing, but also to enhance the way they are managing resource flows in terms of material and energy. And the example that we have here for you today has to do with the sorting systems. We know that sorting uh, different materials in waste streams is one of the biggest challenges that we face when we try to recover uh, value from materials and products. And there are companies developing, developing really high-end technologies on the basis of artificial intelligence to be able to allow us to do it in an effective way. And what's really interesting here is that in addition of uh, understanding what is the specific material that we have in there, we can actually be able to have a much stronger uh, data management and uh, to understand what are the most common materials and what is the overall uh, characterization of the waste flows that we have. Doing this, doing that enhances efficiency to a very high extent in the sorting process, which also makes that not only more economically feasible, but also socially responsible. And here 
uh, an additional piece of data uh, for you having to do with this sorting. Uh, and this is actually one of the key challenges for recycling today in Europe on the basis of a survey made with a number of different companies that are trying to sort and separate waste streams. Over to you, Tim, for the next dimension, which is looping. Daniela, yeah, so looping is, of course, all about uh, value recovery. Uh, getting things back. So it's the one thing is the take back and the other one is the remanufacturing or the, or the value recovery part of it. And the two uh, areas fit extremely closely together. If you don't have a good take back system, then uh, there's nothing to actually recover the value from, of course. So here we have four aspects. Uh, one about uh, recirculation of parts and products. So how do we make sure that we get our fingers in the products and, uh, and, the, and, and the parts from the products as uh, in High enough volumes as we can get to make it a valuable and viable business for us, but also to make sure that we get as many of those products, increase that 39% uh, recycling rate. Uh, if we're looking at electric and electronic equipment, for example, to uh, as close to 100% as we can get. It's about recirculation of materials. So again, we're thinking about this hierarchy, first products, then parts, and then if uh, that fails, the materials. How can we ensure the recirculation of materials? Do we have ways of ensuring a good value chain uh, for the materials that we are recirculating? Can they be put together with virgin materials? Are there other sources of uh, recycled materials uh, to other providers that we can make uh, offers with to potential clients? One of the biggest barriers actually for recirculation at the materials level is that the, uh, the, the clients or a production company would typically be nervous about the, uh, the the security of supply, meaning is there enough uh, material that we can count on from this somehow not quite well-established uh, return system in whatever uh, type of uh, product or material return system you can imagine. So can we uh, improve and increase our ability to ensure a, a security of supply of return materials? It's about infrastructure. Do we have the infrastructure in place to be able to collect, but also to, to sort and to, to, uh, to recirculate? And by very nature, it's about collaboration. The example we have for you here, I really like because it's a company you think, well, really, is this company, again, it's a born circular company, Stainer Recycling. And it's a big inspiration for us because they've been in the, the business of recycling. It's even in their company name. Uh, they were established for exactly the same. Um, they're Stainer Recycling, they're part of uh, Stainer Metal uh, Group. And basically, they usually aim to optimize the resource efficiency by collecting industrial waste from various different industries. However, they decided to start a circular initiative for a broader uh, set of collaborations in the industry towards being able to achieve a, a higher uh, success rate in the circular economy. The circular initiative, as it's called, was held in uh, 2019 uh, as an event which gathered 2,000, uh, so excuse me, 200, not 2,000, that would be even better, but 200 representatives from leading industrial companies, for example, Electrolux, uh, ABB, Combitec, uh, Store Enzo, so Scandinavian, Swedish companies. The target here with this program, this Stainer Recycling uh, Circular Initiative, was to cooperate in generating concrete uh, plans and goals, which are very ambitious goals to create solutions towards a sustainable future. And especially with a focus on creating more usable resources from waste and from for incorporating more recycled materials in the manufacturing industry. So even a well-established organization uh, in this, this field, such as Stainer, is doing all they can to constantly improve their ability to, to recirculate and to loop. If we look at the uh, another uh, interesting fact from uh, European uh, data this time, again, 12.8% uh, is the overall circular material use rate in the EU. And of course, that's a, also a nice uh, number, but uh, there's 83.2% or 87.2% uh, possibility to get it all the way up to 100% to there. So the last I mentioned, Daniela, the last dimension is policy and, and market. We, as a company, can be extremely ready for making this transition to a circular economy. But if we are doing something that goes against legislation, that's an issue. 
And if we are doing something that is not really asked for by the market, it can also be an issue. So what we do here in this dimension is to help companies to understand how ready they are to understand both policy and market dimensions and plan their activities and strategies on the basis of that as well. Um, we look here into uh, market engagement to understand what is the demand and the market for those solutions. We look into the market for those recovered solutions, being them recycled materials or remanufactured products or energy that is being recovered from incineration plants, for instance. And we also look into regulation, both from a national, local point of view, but also internationally, and a sectorial legislation. And sectorial legislation is extremely important for some areas. Um, for example, the food industry. We have loads of limitations in relation to the use of uh, recycled materials uh, directly in contact with food products. And this is actually uh, one of the initiatives that our example company in the next slide is trying to look uh, into. So what uh, Quenos is doing is to collaborate with Cleanway to do a feasibility study to understand how to have this plastic to plastic advanced recycling system that will allow uh, the achievement of food grade recycled plastics to be used by the food industry. This has a really big potential uh, in terms of allowing a higher demand for recycled plastics, at the same time as ensuring safety uh, of customers and higher recyclability rates uh, as well. And as an uh, interesting fact uh, that we see in industry today is that when we talk about plastics, we tend to think that most of it is actually coming from uh, households that are um, delivering uh, the plastics through the sorting systems for recycling. But actually, to date, in uh, EU, uh, the plastic waste is actually typically sourced from industrial waste. And that's the plastic that has, today, the highest recyclability rates. There are, of course, issues in relation to collection sorting uh, for households, but also in relation to potential contaminations that hinder the uh, applicability of those recycled plastics uh, to other applications and minimizes the overall value that are connected to them. So with that, we run through all of the seven dimensions for the value recovery uh, companies. And you might be asking yourself, what is in it for me and what should I do now um, on the basis of this knowledge? And Tim is gonna tell a little bit more about that. Thanks, Daniela. Yeah, so having gone through these different uh, dimensions, these seven dimensions of circularity for value recovery companies, I think you get the impression for the one that the, there's almost a value chain within the value chain here of the different types of organizations because we're covering all the way from uh, uh, up from incineration activities and, and, and incineration plants and, and combined heat and power uh, recoverers. We're bringing those into to, to this uh, redness uh, layer because we can see that there's a, an increasing demand and expectation that they actually themselves move away from simply incinerating with heat and recovery of uh, potential uh, value added products and, and components and materials that could actually have a second or a third or a next life before it comes into that uh, state. So we can see that uh, companies which are uh, standing for incineration with combined heat and power, for example, have also an opportunity here to, to see how they can see and act upon the potential. Then going from materials through uh, components to products. The way in which you can do this, uh, and those of you who have seen the platform before know this, but otherwise you can log on, make yourself a profile for, for free in the ready to do pro, uh, a platform. And you can choose if you're a, a value recovery company, you can go into the readiness profile that looks like uh, this uh, in front of you. You can make your own readiness assessment with these questions that basically the aspects we went through is a one question per aspect in these seven dimensions. Once you've completed that, you can create a benchmark 
And the benchmark is against, uh, it could be against your own organization if you uh, do uh, a readiness assessment for different departments in your organization, but also with all the other companies we have on the platform within this layer of value recovery companies. And over time, we will be collecting more and more different readiness assessments, which makes the benchmark uh, much stronger. Just now, there's only a few companies in there. Um, so uh, once we increase the amount of, of, of organizations there, you'll be able to benchmark there. After that, uh, one thing is to measure your current readiness. And the next thing is to ask, well, what then? What do we do after uh, seeing our readiness and benchmarking ourselves? The next step is to make this prioritization as to where we would like to increase our readiness and what is the transition path we'd like to go through. And even companies which have a very high readiness can see opportunities sometimes to pick one or two aspects in one or two dimensions and, and make a, a transition there. And on our platform, we have over 130 tools, which as you go through the readiness assessment and as you uh, make your prioritize, uh, priorities of which dimensions you'd like to focus on, it filters those 130 tools down to a handful that you can choose to uh, implement yourselves. If uh, you would like some help to do that, we have uh, the two consultancy organizations which are part of the, uh, the Reddit Loop uh, uh, program, which will uh, are available to help you through a so-called accelerator program. And we're just gonna give it, uh, three or four minutes to, to Nikki and to Jar to run us through this accelerator program. I can see there's some uh, nice questions coming in the Q&A, so we need to leave time for that at the end as well. So over to you, Nikki and Jar, to describe for us what the accelerator program actually uh, consists of. Many thanks. Uh, I, we can't uh, turn on the video somehow. I don't know why. Yeah, we would really like to very much. show ourselves as well. But picture as well, Jar. Yes. <laughs> um, so we're basically uh, a part of me, uh, part of this, uh, Red's Loop platform uh, from Vegan Moe and also from Rumble in a strategic partnership with the two to provide uh, insights and to participate in these uh, programs with, with you as a company. So what we basically do, we, we go out to the company, we coordinate all the different steps with you and facilitate uh, the discussions, facilitate, facilitate the different uh, uh, questionnaires and also provide uh, knowledge and uh, provide uh, insights for the different discussions. Uh, at Vegan Moe, we have uh, different services with uh, climate accounting uh, and uh, climate strategy and also within circular economy and we can provide that knowledge as, as well. So Niki, would you like to introduce yourself as well and, and also the first uh, couple steps uh, and then I will take over afterwards. Yes, uh, thanks, Ja, and thanks uh, also for having us. Uh, my name is Nikki Bly. I'm senior manager here in Rumble. Uh, for those of you who don't know Rumble, um, uh, we are a uh, engineering and, and uh, management consultancy with about 17,000 people global. We are um, in the uh, uh, mostly active in the Nordic regions, uh, but have a global outreach, which, uh, as Ja also said, with the process we would go through with you could be interesting about your supply chains. Um, basically, our our role, both from of Vegan Moe and Rumble, uh, is to help you uh, basically concretize this this kind of uh, process. What does it mean to to become circular in your company? And um, uh, we have on the left hand side here on the slide these uh, the different steps. Once uh, beginning would be always be to reach out to us. Uh, and have a dialogue with us and we are actually coordinating internally so it, it doesn't matter who you contact uh, of us but uh, first step for you is simply uh, uh, would be to uh, to contact uh, us then the second uh, point here uh, on the left hand side and maybe you can go further with the slides uh, to more daniela thanks um, it's basically engaging the stakeholders in your company, maybe also your suppliers already, but really uh, uh, having this dialogue, who would be relevant to have along this journey to accelerate your circularity, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, maturity and also journey. Um, we would then revisit your circular, circular readiness assessment that uh, Tim and Daniela just said, which is so to say uh, online. So the, the, the entire platform, of course, uh, is behind that, but we would guide you then. Okay, what does that mean? What is what is relevant for you? What do we see with your uh, in your situation? Your concrete um, uh, uh, 
a business context, what would be relevant there. Um, and we would also together in a, in a workshop setting, uh, as you, uh, as, as uh, Ja also just mentioned, we would help you by an accelerator uh, uh, process uh, of a couple of weeks, um, simply reflecting what, what, is, what is in the circular reality, what does it say you, what is relevant here? Um, and uh, of course, reflect on strengths and gaps. And in this way, uh, basically, again, make this concrete for you. What does it actually mean? Which of those uh, dimensions would be relevant for you? Is it the digitalization or is it uh, the business model maybe where to focus on it and what comes further on? And what we also would do in such a uh, uh, accelerator uh, process with you is this um, looking into the tools that Tim and Daniel just mentioned, the, the vast number of tools um, available in the platform uh, to find out, okay, which which of those is relevant for you to to work further, maybe. Um, but uh, uh, with this reflection, then further on uh, improvement opportunities come. Maybe maybe Ja, if you uh, uh, explain that. Uh, yeah, so yeah. it builds on upon the the strength and gaps. So we actually, uh, in continuation with the the workshop, there we we choose specific tools that will suit your focus areas. Uh, so basically, you choose uh, you, you get a an overview of the strengths and the gaps uh, from the previous steps and you have specific focus areas. It doesn't necessarily mean something that you need to uh, implement right now is super important, but it could also be like the next step that you also want our uh, expertise and knowledge uh, with and, and provide inputs for those things. So we basically uh, choose some tools and um, find different Im improvement opportunities for the second uh, workshop actually. If, for example, it could be conceptualizing um, specific ideas with, within these dimensions or uh, building a, a new business model for, for, a, for a new service you could provide or uh, something with the very recovery innovation uh, as well. Um, and then we, uh, we, we evaluate and choose specific opportunities and also map out different uh, action uh, points that you need to take uh, in a action plan. So we actually take, oh, okay, we say we have these different improvement opportunities. How do we reach those goals? And what kind of steps do we need to, to take? Is it a pilot testing? Do we need to contact some of our stakeholders? Which stakeholders uh, do we need to contact at this uh, certain point of time? And we basically map that out in a Gantt chart or a roadmap that we provide to you and go through with, uh, with you as well for the, for the first year. And that's basically how you start your transition. Circular economy is super broad and can be super complex. So the first step is to break it down into principal aspects and, and um, also be, uh, be insightful about what are your strengths and gaps and, and take on those opportunities. And that's why we are here to help you facilitate the, the process from Vigan Moe and Ambu. Um, yes. I'll give the word back to Tim and Daniela, and thank you for uh, for uh, for the presentation as well. Thank you for that, Sneaky and Jao. Yeah. So if you have any uh, queries and and an interest of uh, of course either using the platform on your own, you can go to the address in the bottom left of all the slides and make your own profile, and or you can get in touch with Nikki or, or Jar or their colleagues uh, through the platform as well, and simply ask for a. A, a contact and a, and a discussion there with them. So where are we in terms of uh, the, the platforms unfolding, as you could say, as it is now? We, uh, with today's webinar, we've just released uh, this third layer. So we now have value recovery and materials providers. We put these two or we develop these two layers closely together because this is actually where the circular economy meets or becomes where a linear economy becomes a, a circular economy. So uh, where a value recovery company and a materials provider, hopefully in the future, will become the same dimension, it'll be the same thing. That's the, the ultimate goal, you could say, um, at, at least in that part of it. And there's all sorts of other uh, smaller circles in between to keep value into uh, in society. And then we have the materials uh, providers, as I said, but also the product manufacturers. In terms of where we go next with our, our launch of the different platform layers, uh, we've just released the the, uh, the layer here, we actually pre-released at the end of December, but uh, we're officially launching it today. And then, oh, excuse me, uh, in the uh, the coming, oh, they don't want to show. 
it's a secret. <laughs> in in the coming uh, um, months, we will be uh, basically uh, launching other uh, layers. Let me just try one more time for you, um, then we can see. Uh, we go. Yeah. So within this year, we're working currently on the the layer for component manufacturers, and then later on at the end of the year, we'll be releasing the layer for retailers, and then in uh, uh, 2024 we will look at logistics providers and repair and maintenance services. So then we'll have all of the seven value chain layers there. Um, so the project, just to, to close up, uh, is uh, supported by the Industry Foundation. And the reason to, to note this is that they have a number of other projects going on which may connect in some way or other to the work that we're doing here. And they do, in fact, and we have a lot of collaboration with the different organizations or different projects under the Industry Foundation. As you uh, just saw from the presentations from, from uh, Ja and Niki, we have these two uh, organizations, Vegan Moore and Rambel, who are creating these accelerator projects and they're very interested in hearing from, from you there. And then we have a, a nice steering uh, group, which uh, consists of representatives from MAID, the Manufacturing Academy of Denmark, from the Danish Business Authority, uh, and from the Confederation of Danish Industry. So they're keeping us on our toes as well. And thanks to them for, for the support for the project. To end up now, um, we'd like to uh, start to answer some of the questions that you've, you've brought. And as we're doing that, just uh, this is a, a small uh, inspiration for you for just some of the companies that have been uh, engaging with us on the platform. And uh, there's many, many more. We have uh, hundreds of companies on the platform. So when you start to benchmark yourselves, You'll be benchmarking against, uh, depending on which layer you go to, of course, maybe some of these. We will never give it away which companies are on the platform uh, uh, in, in each layer as such. Uh, but these ones have given us the permission to show uh, that they're involved in the project and have been uh, collaborators on the Ready to Loop project here. So just to give you some inspiration there. That was our presentation. Uh, Daniela, uh, we have some uh, Q&A, and if any of you have other questions, we have quite a few uh, questions and answers coming in now. So, uh, Daniela, should we represent the Q&A as a, as a ping pong, and then we can uh, see how we can answer the questions? Let's do, yeah, and, and I can see that we have many interesting questions coming along in maybe three main areas. The first one having to do with the different dimension and aspects that we talked about. The second cluster more connected to a systemic view on how this is being implemented. And the third cluster more connected to actually the use of the tool, both in companies, but also uh, in academic and teaching areas. So let me start with the first question for you, Tim. Yeah. And this is a question that has to do with uh, incineration companies. Mm -hmm. The question is, do you think companies like incineration plants are ahead of the game in terms of value recovery? in comparison to other energy producers? And how do you think they can still improve in the context of value recovery? Thanks for the question. Yeah, so that's a really nice question. And I think uh, the answer to the first part of the question is, do I think that companies are, uh, are ahead of the game in terms of other value recovery companies? I guess so, because they have the, the whole reverse logistics in place. Other energy companies, um, have other types of, uh, of sources of, 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 of fuel uh, to, to their, uh, their energy provision, whether the fuel is wind or whether it's gas or what it could be. Uh, but incineration uh, companies have, of course, uh, the reverse logistics in there. The, the idea is to, uh, as we mentioned a couple of times, uh, is to bring the level of value or to keep the level of value as high as possible. So the value add that we as a society is uh, put into, mm -hmm. uh, and as companies put into products, so to materials, we make them into components, into products, can we keep that value out as much as possible? Mm -hmm. And after that, once we've circulated it uh, as many times as we possibly can, can we then start mm -hmm. to cascade it to the stage where we may need to incinerate it for a, a heat recovery, uh, but maybe it's uh, some components in the meantime have become biodegradable or summer components are uh, uh, have multiple life cycles more than the actual product itself so the idea there is to see how can we use the the knowledge that the uh, value recovery companies incineration companies incineration plants have um, and then see how they can use that infrastructure as a basis to lifting the uh, the value level 
from the uh, the products there. So I'm going to ask you a question now, Daniela, and uh, this one is about the uh, um, proportion of um, circular innovation. So um, the question is, uh, do we have a sense of the proportion of circular innovation business model or systems that occurs within an organization versus innovation through collaboration, like, for example, uh, the Danish deposit return company? Yeah, it, it's, it's a really good question. And we actually explored that quite a lot in the circuit project, which was looking into circular economy implementation in the Nordic industry. And we actually identify three main types of collaborations that may occur to ensure those circular systems to happen. The first one is that companies, as you mentioned, change their business model and try to understand how to incorporate new value creation and value delivery initiatives that will ensure a higher circularity. The second one is that they partner with other organizations that could either be competing companies, and that's where it becomes interesting, but also companies across the value chain to actually go together towards the implementation of a given axiom. And the third area would actually be that companies get together and establish an outside organization, like the case of the return system here in Denmark. Yeah. What we see today is that the majority of companies are going towards option one, changing uh, their business model and trying to see how they adapt to it. But we also see more and more collaboration coming along. And that's actually one of the main reasons uh, that we are proposing the Ready to Look project to allow companies to understand where the collaboration opportunities are and how they can actually work together towards achieving higher circularity levels. Um, and we can share more information about that in the circuit project. I will add the link in the chat for you. Um, but I have another question for you, Tim. Um, and this is in relation to circularity versus CO2. I guess we know that those are the two very big hot topics today uh, in the sustainability discussion. And the question that we have here um, has to do with um, how does the circular economy consider the carbon emission footprint in relation to circularity, or are those two concepts in conflict? Yeah, thanks for the nice question. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's extremely important to, to keep aware that uh, we don't do circular if it's not sustainable. Uh, so that's the first point. I think that's what you're getting at as well with, with the question here. So we need to always look at, in, in any circularity perspective, uh, we need to to keep a, abreast of whether we what we're doing is is actually helping or hindering uh, the the ultimate goal of uh, creating a more sustainable uh, future or sustainable uh, situation than, than than we're in today. So sometimes I think that uh, circular economy can be in conflict with uh, the, uh, the the CO two um, uh, agenda or CO two uh, challenge. Let's say uh, is a better phrase. And I think that uh, there we need to be really, really careful. Um, uh, very often, however, circularity directly contributes to a better uh, um, CO2 footprint by exactly reducing the, the need for uh, taking more materials out of the ground to make more products and to have shorter lifetime products. But it takes an investment. And the investment could be in actually, and, and in the design room, in the product development uh, uh, department of a company, there may be some paradoxes there. The companies that have been designing and developing products for the last 20 years with a more and more eco-efficient uh, profile. And then we suddenly expect that now we, we need to go from, not from eco-efficient, but eco-effective to make more robust, more circular, have a longer lifetime. And some of the initial investments in materials and components in robustness in product longevity may be counter- uh, intuitive to doing the original eco design or eco efficiency strategy. And that's where we need to couple the whole uh, circularity and CO2 discussions together with actual uh, strategies to, to not just to make sure that we develop products which have a greater circularity potential, but we need to realize that potential uh, in, in uh, the real world by new business models, by new incentives, by sharing uh, models and so forth to make sure that we can achieve that. And then at the end of life, uh, which is basically what we're focusing on in this particular layer, 
Um, I think we also need to consider, for example, collection. If we were to collect um, uh, soft plastic on its own without collecting it together with hard plastic, I guess that the CO2 footprint would be greater if we only collected soft plastic as a fraction on its own uh, for recycling, because we'd only have to drive a couple of kilometers in the truck before we'd expended more CO2 than we could get back uh, or to save from, uh, from making the, uh, that, that loop closed. So we need to be smart about the strategies and the combinations. And with soft plastic, we combine it with hard plastic, at least here in Denmark. And then it becomes a little bit of fill in between the hard plastic, which of course also has some form of a, of a, a break even point after which a certain amount of kilometers may actually be uh, not beneficial. But this is about developing the infrastructure at the same time as we're developing the, 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 the culture and the way in, in which we're working. Rather larger answer to that question. What time are we on? We have time for one more question, maybe. Daniela, uh, how does the circular economy consider the carbon emissions footprints? Oh, no, we just had that one. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, the um, in terms of the trade-offs between sustainability and safety when trying to incorporate recycled plastics in our production because of the risk of contamination with toxic compounds, can you help uh, or can our tool help to find concrete solutions to balance those types of conflicting interests? Yeah, I think that the tool can help in two different ways. The first one is to actually uh, enable the companies to identify where the conflicts are. This is one of the uh, potential conflicts that we have between circularity and sustainability and safety and so forth. But depending on the sector that you are at, there might be other important conflicts to take into account as well. And what the tool also helps is actually to understand in relation to other companies within the same sector, the same industry, the same geographical location, what are the areas that they are focusing on as providing an advice in relation to uh, areas that you should at least consider uh, whether they could actually help you to addressing uh, those conflicts. And then afterwards, once you've defined it, where to focus on and what are the different directions, then there are a number of different tools in the platform that can help you to handle those conflicts and to ensure that the trade-off will be minimum and that you can actually minimize the risks by implementing circularity as well. Thanks for that, Daniela. Yeah, and I think the other part of that is, of course, we have the, the consultants which can help you to go even deeper into the, the questions and the, and the technical questions that may come up if you need some assistance with that as well. And you can reach out to those. The time is 12 o'clock, um, uh, Danish time or Central European time at least. So I think we should stop here for out of respect for, for your time. Many thanks for joining us. Uh, we will make this available to you uh, via the Ready to Loop website uh, when the video has been compiled. The questions we did not manage to answer, we will also answer on the website. So we'll uh, create some uh, responses to the questions there that we didn't manage to answer today. It was really nice to get lots of questions. Um, it's always a shame not to be able to answer them, but it's, I'd actually rather have more questions uh, than time to answer them uh, because we'll make sure we do it afterwards. Many thanks for joining us. Enjoy the platform. Have a, a, a nose around and, and try it out. If there's any queries at all, write to us on the Ready to Loop email and somebody will uh, get back to you and help you along with your uh, circularity journey. Many thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.